Welcome, everybody. You, uh, you're giving me great hope <coughs> because this is one of the largest turnouts we've, we've ever had, and uh, it is to hear one of the preeminent scholars of our time. And that, it gives me hope, frankly, that, uh, that all is not lost in culture. So it's, I'm very glad to see all of you here for what will be, I know, very special. Um, Robert Alter is professor of the graduate school and emeritus professor of Hebrew and comparative literature at the University of California at Berkeley. He has been there since 1967, the year I graduated from high school. Um, and so did Howard. We both graduated in 1967. It's an important year. Um, he has a long list of accolades. Uh, he, he's, um, well, I, I could read them all, um, but he doesn't want me to. Um, so he has many accolades. He has honorary degrees. He has an honorary degree from Yale, but he has a real one from Harvard. So there you are. Um, I think that's very important. Uh, he, he has been a fellow of everything that a scholar should be a fellow of. He has 28 published books, and he just told me about two more that should come out this year. One is a memoir about his writing life, and the other is a biography of uh, Amos Oz which I'm looking forward to both of those very much. I first knew about Robert Alter in the 1980s because I, I was a religion reporter for the Orange County Register, and they let me have subscriptions to magazines that they paid for. And I got Commentary Magazine, and I read it. And uh, that's where I first read Robert Alter. And I, I found, I always read his articles because they were refreshing <laughs> and not, polemical, um, but in the end, they, they are, uh, they're not, it's not polemical, but by their very existence, they, they are an argument for a life of the mind and a life of thought that, um, that is in itself um, something that is, I don't know, it's a statement of, a, of its own about reality and about the value of literature. We were talking, I grew up on the King James Bible. And um, I mean, I could start quoting for you now. Um, a lot, let us now go even to Bethlehem. Um, and then when I was in graduate school, I got a master's in English from the University of Michigan. And I focused on medieval literature. And when I came to class, the other students would all say, did you, did you look that stuff up last night? Did you sit up last night? You always know the references. I thought, no, I've been reading the Bible since I was six years old, and I just, I just know it. It's part of my, my being. And so um, when, when the uh, Hebrew Bible translation started coming out, I was excited, and we got the, I think, which was first? Was it Genesis? Um, and I started reading it and then reading um, the book that, that Professor Alter wrote subsequent to finishing, I believe, The Art of Bible Translation, um, I came to understand something about the lack of, um, what? The, the lack of vividness of the language in the English translations and how graphic and powerful the Hebrew is. We were talking earlier, Isaiah particularly took my breath away. But the Psalms, I'm just, I am now, I am now about to begin Proverbs. I've, I've read everything, the other two volumes, and I'm, I'm almost done. The foot, there are as many footnotes as there are Psalms, so it takes a while. But um, Professor Alder told me that he tried to talk them out of um, putting the, the footnotes in because it would be so long. Well, true, but the other side of it is the footnotes are wonderful, so you couldn't do it without them. So it, it takes a, a while. And I thought I'd conclude this introduction um, by reading Psalm 1 in the Robert Alter translation, which took my breath away when, when I read it the first time. Happy the man who has not walked in the wicked's counsel, nor in the way of offenders has stood, nor in the session of scoffers 
has sat. But the Lord's teaching is his desire, and his teaching he murmurs day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by streams of water that bears its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. And in all that he does, he prospers. Not so the wicked, but like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in judgment, nor offenders in the band of the righteous. For the Lord embraces the way of the righteous, and the way of the wicked is lost. With that, I'll give you Professor Robert Alt. Now, is my mic functioning? I think I hear it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah? okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, R Roberta. Um, I love the way you read the first song. <laughs> we should go on tour together. <laughs> now, I, I would first like to uh, express a, a word of appreciation to the Amundsen's. Uh, Maybe about a dozen years ago, perhaps a little longer, uh, I was approached by them and they said, we would like to do something to foster the study of, uh, transla uh, of um, religion on your campus. So I said, well, you know, you could fund a, uh, a program or um, a, a, a fellowship for students I said, no, what we really want to do is fund the work of an individual scholar, namely you. <laughs> so the, the, this is the, the easiest grant application <laughs> in my life. I wrote a, a short le half-page letter saying what, what I wanted to do, and then the funding actually was a big help to me uh, mainly for secretarial assistance in, in the last phase of my uh, translation work. Okay, now, th the obvious question, I know that, Roberta, you know the answer, but uh, not everybody in the room may. The, the obvious question is, why would anyone want to do still another translation of the Bible? That is, uh, on the one hand, we have the King James Version. And uh, my admiration for the King James Version has not diminished over the years, but it has problems. Not only the fact that after four centuries, uh, the language is uh, archaic to the point where there are words that are no longer in use and so forth, but also um, is wonderfully eloquent but the, uh, the eloquence is, um, is not uh, consistent. Maybe as I go along, I'll, I'll give you just w one example. Um, sometimes it's just too wordy, where the, the Hebrew is powerfully compact. And then, alas, with all the achievements of uh, the Christian humanists in, in getting a handle on biblical Hebrew, there were many gaps, uh, and th there uh, are quite a few mistakes, some of them egregious mistakes, in the King James Version. And maybe if anyone is curious about that, uh, I, I will be happy in the Q&A to, to give you a couple of examples. Now, but my real quarrel is with all the different translations done by, by sundry denominational groups, Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish, basically in the second half of the 20th century. I think I've, I've come to see that what they do with the Bible is unforgivable. <laughs> and, and I'll explain this briefly in the following way. I, I think to 
do a translation of the Bible justice, you have to harbor two loves. A love for biblical Hebrew, for the language of the Bible, and a love for English. And both these loves are entirely lacking in all those committees. <laughs> well, what I mean is this, that for the, the biblical scholars whose credentials are impressive, you know, they have PhDs from the University of Chicago and Yale Divinity and so forth in biblical studies or in England from Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, and they know all sorts of things, but the Hebrew language of the Bible remains an object of study for them. It's not something they love, and you can tell that in the way they, they translate. Now, as far as love of the English language, alas, these translations show a, a tin ear for literary English which was not true in the, the 17th century when the King James uh, companies, as they were called, were working. I think that probably is because there wasn't a split then between literary culture and other kinds of culture. So um, uh, Lancet Andrews, who, probably the, the leading figure among the King James translators, who was Bishop of London, was one of the great prose stylists uh, of the early 17th century. And I can assure you we have no great prose stylists uh, among these committees. So, okay. Uh, I, I will uh, leave that um, at that and, try and sort of lay out a, an agenda for um, uh, translating the Bible hastening to say that as with any great work, you can't totally implement the, the uh, agenda. Th there are things that you just can't do in the target language. Or you, and then maybe some genius down the road will figure out a way to do it, but, but you haven't been able to figure out to, to do it. So um, I'll begin with rhythm. Now, we all know that, that poetry is supposed to be rhythmic, and I'll get to an example, or maybe two examples in just a moment, but um, what people, including scholars, are not aware of is that great literary prose is also rhythmic, and that the, the rhythm is part of the meaning of the, the, uh, uh, the writing. Uh, my own discovery was when I began the first chapter of um, uh, Genesis, I had a little checklist of things I wanted to do, and rhythm was not part of it. Until I came to the half verse that describes the creation of the heavenly luminaries. Now, in my translation, it comes out like this. God created, that's before the, this clause, the great light for dominion of day and the small light for dominion of night and the stars. Then I stopped myself, because why did I do that? Why dominion? Well, first I said that's because everyone translates it as an infinitive, to rule over, one dreadful translation, this is a tinier illustration, the, the Jewish publication society has to dominate the day, which is, you know, the Soviet Union dominated the small states of Eastern Europe after World War II. The sun and the moon don't dominate the day and the night. So, uh, but then I, I realized that there, there was a more important reason, which is the rhythm. Uh, that is, the Hebrew sounds like this. Et ha-ma'or ha-gadol l'memshelet ha-yom v'et ha-ma'or ha-katon l'memshelet ha-layla v'et ha-kochavim. 
I'll repeat my translation. You'll see how close they are. The great light for dominion of day, that's Memshela Tayom in the Hebrew, and the small light for dominion of night and the stars. Well, some of you may say, oh, so what? You know, you're a professor of literature and you fuss around with these things, but they're not important. I think that they are important. Th that is, you cannot separate uh, rhythm from meaning in a great work. Um, the priestly writer who is responsible for the first version of creation has a sense of creation as something that's beautifully choreographed. There's this harmonious progression from day one to day six, and then the first Sabbath. That is, uh, um, creation itself in his theology is a beautifully orchestrated thing. And the wonderful cadence, I won't repeat it a third time, the wonderful cadence of this half verse really gives you a kind of subliminal sense that everything in creation is beautifully ordered. I'll throw out a, a post-biblical example of the importance of rhythm. The, one of the great works of American literature, Moby Dick, which probably most of you have read, famously has many sentences that have gorgeous iambic cadences that are reminiscent of Shakespeare, especially, and to some extent uh, of Milton's Paradise Lost as well. Well, if you took out all, all those cadences, if a mad editor decided uh, I'm, where Melville ha has written in his draft, uh, the whale has no face, I'm going to say the whale has no countenance because that's more dignified. What you would end up with is a Moby Dick, which is kind of an interesting story about a, a mad sea captain in pursuit of a white whale, but it would not have the grandeur. It would not have the cosmic reach and the epic, uh, um, uh, the, the, the epic dignity that Moby Dick does. So I think the same thing is true with a rhythm in the Bible. Now, a tricky thing about trying to convey biblical rhythms in English is that uh, they, the, Hebrew language, it says the biblical Hebrew, is very compact. First of all, it has few polysyllabic words. Secondly, um, because of the structure of the language, I won't bother you with the technical terms, you, if you say, um, well, a simple thing like he created, you don't need the he in the Hebrew because the, the, the way the verb is conjugated tells you it's a he. And if there's an object to the verb, it, it's tacked on to the end of the verb as a suffix, so, which means that it's often possible to say in three words what takes seven words in, in uh, English. Now, uh, and, and I think this is very important for the expressive power of, of uh, the Hebrew Bible. So uh, first, I'll, I'll give you an illustration from the King James Version, where the first half of the, the verse, it's a line of poetry, is perfect. And the second half falls on its face. Um, Job says, why died I not from the womb, that's half a verse, uh, which in the Hebrew sounds like this, lama lo merechem amut. And the second half of the King James Version, why did I not give up the, the ghost when I came out of uh, the belly? Which is terrible, you know, it's about a dozen or more words 
The Hebrew is Lama Lo Mi Beten Egva, uh, which I think I translated, Why Did I Not Expire from the Womb? Okay, so, so that's, that's one thing uh, one has to watch out for. And sometimes the solution is very simple. Psalm 30. Now, Psalm 30 is a Thanksgiving psalm. From what we can make out, the, the speaker, as in many of the Thanksgiving psalms, has been in a, a condition of near death. Like he's running 105 fever for two weeks and people are giving up on him. And then suddenly the fever breaks and he's okay. So he composes or has a, a Levite compose for him a Thanksgiving psalm. And in this psalm, he recalls the, uh, the words of desperation in his prayer to God when he was running that 105 fever. Uh, so we, we have um, uh, the following. Um, uh, what in the King James Version, followed by all the moderns, what profit is there in my blood? Uh, actually, the moderns make, they make it worse. They, they don't believe that, that people can understand metaphors. So instead of blood, the physically concrete thing, which the Hebrew writers love, they substitute death. Uh, but uh, I'll say that again. What profit is there in my blood? There's no rhythm to it. It doesn't sound like a line of poetry or a half line of poetry. Now, if you look in your printed King James Version, you'll see that, that the words is there are italicized. In the 17th century, it was a different font, but same idea, which is not emphasis. They use this consistently to show that they're supplying a, a word or words that are not in the Hebrew, okay? I looked at it and I said, wait a minute. Uh, you don't need those two words. That is, if you translate what prophet in my blood, you get a poetic rhythm which happens to be identical with the Hebrew, ma betza bidami. So sometimes th there are these uh, solutions. And um, I, I, I would say that, that my general strategy was to avoid polysyllabic words whenever possible. Uh, instead of um, uh, iniquity, which I don't particularly like, crime. Uh, and the, the, there are a, a lot of other examples. On the whole, this meant favoring the Anglo-Saxon component of the English language rather th than the Greek and Roman, although crime happens to come from a Latin word in, in, in that particular uh, case. Um, and um, so uh, I favored short words, short concrete words, and I also eliminated um, uh, unnecessary words, as is there in the example I gave, or in the first psalm, which Roberta read so uh, beautifully, um, happy the man. You don't have to say happy is the man, right? Okay. Uh, now, um, let me go on to one of the, the, the greatest conundrums for any translator, which is sound play. Now, to some extent, sound play is puns. And that is maddening. <laughs> you two can't do it. You know, you can't take a, 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 a pun from one language and uh, move it to another. Like when John Donne on his deathbed ends every stanza of, of this confessional poem, uh, uh, when I have done, I have not done, for I have more. So how can you do that in French or German or Hebrew or anything else? 
Okay, so mostly I throw up my hands in despair at the puns, but otherwise uh, you can do certain things. Okay, let's go back to Psalm 30. At the end of the psalm, thanking God, the speaker says, first and translated it very literally, um, you have turned my mourning, M-O-U, you have turned my mourning into a dance for me. Now the Hebrew sounds like this. Hafachta mispedi lemachol li. We have two nouns that begin with an M sound. The first one, misped, means a, a morning chant or um, something like that. In modern Hebrew, it means eulogy. And uh, the second noun is machol, which means dance. So I realized that the sound play was very meaningful. Th that is, by juxtaposing two nouns that begin with the same consonant, the poet is reinforcing the sense that God has the power to flip something 180 degrees from a state of mourning to dance. And then every once in a while, uh, as a translator, you get lucky, and suddenly it dawned on me, hey, there's a neat one-syllable word in English that begins with D that means the chant of mourning. You turn my dirge to a dance for me. And I was very happy when I came up with that. Okay, now, um, since Roberta mentioned Isaiah, of whom uh, I have the profoundest uh, admiration, I, I will say that Isaiah, the son of Amotz, uh, the first of the three poets who were um, bracketed uh, uh, in the book of, uh, of Isaiah. He was a great poet as well as a, a great uh, prophet. And one of his, as he looked around him in the kingdom of Judah in the, the seventh century BCE, he saw terrible things happening, morally terrible things. And one of his devices was to take two words that sounded alike, uh, one being very positive and the other very negative, and to highlight through that sound play the extreme perversion of values in the kingdom of Judah. So, uh, in chapter 5, when uh, the prophet is referring to God, he says, and he, I'm going to translate it very literally and then switch to what I did. Um, although by, by and large, my translation is more literal than the existing ones, sometimes more literal than the King James Version. So, uh, and he, God, he hoped for justice and look a blight. Now, the word for justice in Hebrew is mishpat. The word for blight is mispach. So they're very close in sound and dead opposite in meaning. And I thought to myself, i, I got to do something with that. Or, or the, the point that the prophet is making is blunted. So I ended up translating, uh, he hoped for justice and look jaundice. Now, jaundice is a particular kind of blight, but I, I think it, it, it works well enough without distorting the Hebrew. Then in the second half of the line, I just want to illustrate that you often have to compromise as a translator, and some of the... Uh, compromises are more painful and some of them feel sort of okay. So the second half of the line is like this. He, he hoped, th that verb carries over, for 
um, uh, righteousness and look a scream, which is really powerful. Now, the word for righteousness is staka. The word for scream is tsaka. So you see what a, what a, a great master of the language Isaiah, the son of Amos, was. Well, what I came up with, it's only halfway there. I couldn't do better, which is, I translated, he hoped for righteousness and look wretchedness. Now, it's okay. Uh, the, the, my two reservations about it, you're not being honest if you don't sometimes have reservations about your own translation. Uh, one is I didn't particularly like the, the uh, polysyllabic nature of righteousness, wretchedness. The second thing is that it loses the sharp edge of violence, of scream. So you do what you can, and uh, as I said, uh, sometimes what you do is only halfway there. Okay, now, I want to talk uh, a little bit about um, uh, syntax. First, overall, I, I have done what the, the King James Version did in the prose. Uh, not because I was imitating them, but I, I thought that, that they were doing the right thing, uh, which is I follow what's called technically, don't get alarmed, uh, parataxis. Now, parataxis simply means parallel syntax. Uh, and Abraham rose in the morning, and he looked out, and he saw, and, and like that. Um, and I find that it's often quite uh, eloquent. And if you repackage it as the kind of syntax you find in the daily newspaper, uh, as the 20th century translators did, you lose that, that sense of, of eloquence. OK, personal story. I, I, was, I, I won't mention his name. I, I was friendly from my teens with, with a man who became uh, an eminent Bible scholar. And so when my Genesis came out, because I sent him a copy, and he wrote back, trying to be tactful. He, by the way, was on one of those committees. <laughs> we had a very different concept of translation of the Bible. So he said, first, I don't know why you use so many ugly words. I didn't think I was using ugly words. <laughs> but secondly, he said, you can't say and, and like that, because the English language doesn't tolerate it. He said, uh, you, you have to rearrange the syntax. So I, I wrote back to him. I said, well, I didn't think I was using ugly words. And as for the syntax, uh, the, for my money, one of the greatest extended pieces of prose poetry in the English language written in the 20th century is Molly Bloom's soliloquy at the end of James Joyce's uh, Ulysses. And it's an, an, an. Um, I, I, I can't resist adding a little personal anecdote. I have a good friend uh, who teaches literature at Stanford. So he was teaching a course in which, an undergraduate course, he had his students read uh, Ezekiel or parts of Ezekiel. And as an experiment, he... Uh, he had them read uh, a couple of passages in uh, w one of the 20th century translations by committee and my translation. And they all said that, that they, they particularly said that they liked the parallel syntax, that it made things more concrete, it spoke to them more. So the notion that uh, young people in the 21st century are incapable of relating to parataxis, I think it's totally off. Um, 
Okay, then the, there is often an expressive manipulation of word order, which is what syntax is in the Bible, and usually you can reproduce this. So here is my favorite example. When Jacob's sons come back from their first journey to Egypt, they give dad the news that, that uh, 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 Simeon is being held hostage and that the man who rules over all of Egypt, they don't know that it's Joseph, of course, uh, will not see their face again unless they bring down Benjamin. This is um, Jacob's response in my translation. Me, you have bereaved. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and Benjamin you would take. On me is all the burden. It, it almost scans his poetry, not quite. Now, I want to focus just for a moment on me you have bereaved. Uh, you might say, well, that's not the way English works. You say, you bereave me. Of course, if you go back, say, a century and a half in the history of English poetry, you have lots of syntactic inversions like this. Like Keats's famous, um, on first looking into Chapman's Homer, the first line is, much have I wandered in the realms of gold. Now, that's not normal English syntax. I, I've wandered much in the realms of gold. But he wanted, not only for the rhythm, but for the, the emphasis of meaning, to put much at the very beginning. I think there, there, there's even a certain advantage to giving a slightly antique coloration to a translation of the Bible. So that you're reminding readers, you're making re readers feel that uh, it's not a book that was written the day before yesterday. You know, of course, you, you can't uh, produce uh, an English that sounds like English would have sounded in Iron Age too, but you, you, uh, you can at least give it, as I say, a little antique coloration. But okay, what's going on in the Hebrew that, that I wanted to do this? The normal way to say you have bereaved me in biblical Hebrew is to take the verb to, to bereave and tack on to it an accusative suffix. It would be one word, um, shikaltuni. The conjugation of the verb tells, tells you that it's you, and the, the ni at the end tells you me. But that isn't what the, the Hebrew writer did. Instead, he said, Oti, me, you have bereaved, which is unusual in biblical Hebrew. You can do it, but you, it isn't done most of the time. So I, I asked myself, why is that important? Because from the moment that the bloodied tunic of Joseph is brought to their father, Jacob becomes what I've called somewhere in print a prima donna of paternal grief. And here, you, by the way, he's decided that Joseph is dead and, and also Simeon is as good as dead. So he, puts, he has to put himself first. Me you have bereaved. And then at the end, on me is all the burden. So, so you, you see how ordering of words becomes so important for the, the, uh, the meaning of uh, the, the, the text. Now, I would like to um, zero in uh, on the meaning of words. OK, we, we have a challenge which you can't entirely solve, which is we're looking at a language as, as it was written anywhere from um, 2,500 to, uh, say, 3,000 
years ago. That's older, the, the, the older end of it is three centuries older than Homer. So do we really know what those words meant exactly? And, and, and let me tell you, th there is a, uh, a lot, there are a lot of words in the Hebrew Bible that appear only once. And what are you going to do with them? Uh, you can um, just guess. <laughs> you, you, you can look to other ancient Semitic languages, but that's tricky. You know, there's a French term, uh, faux ami, which means false friend. Uh, th that is, l words that look to be cognates in two different languages can mean very different things. For example, um, uh, if you ran across the French verb assister, you would think that, that it means to help somebody, to assist, but it doesn't. It means to attend, like to, to, uh, 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 to assister at a, a conference or, or a concert. So, I, I suspect that many of the proposed cognates from other uh, Semitic languages are false friends. Uh, so generally, you, um, w with uh, the rare words, you um, have to guess by context. And it's still a guess. But then uh, th there's a, another issue, which is, connotation. Um, and here, I, th I think that biblical scholars, because they, they tend to focus on lexical values, on uh, dictionary listings, they're tone deaf to connotation, to linguistic register. Uh, and here, I think we can sometimes uh, get help. And uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, in the story, not generally read in Sunday school, of the, the rape of Tamar by, by her half brother uh, Amnon, uh, following the advice of a dubious friend, he pretends to be ill uh, and uh, he sends word to his father that, that, he sh that David should delegate his beautiful daughter Tamar to bring him food. Now, uh, the food is named, it's le vivot, uh, and uh, it looks like something you fry, but um, we really didn't know exactly what le vivot are, except that it, it is related to the Hebrew word lev means heart. So uh, 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 some kind of being smit with, with romantic desire, or maybe just desire, is suggested by the, the food name. But th there is a general word for food used, oh, maybe half a dozen times in this story, as well as a, a cognate verb from that same root, and that's birya. Now, Everybody translated it as food, because it does seem to mean food, more or less. But I said, wait a minute, it's a pretty rare, rare word. It hardly ever appears elsewhere. And in uh, the story of uh, uh, Amnon and Tamar, it is used repeatedly. Why does the, the uh, writer do that? Now, I have to say that my greatest guide to translate in the Bible was not a, a lexicon a, and not uh, other commentaries, but um, a Hebrew concordance. In other words, I, I look to see how this word is used elsewhere. So I discovered that in every, as I said, it's not used very often. In 
in, very, in every instance where it occurs, it's food that you give to somebody who has been fasting or otherwise doing poorly. So it's like chicken soup. But I couldn't use chicken soup because they hadn't domesticated the chicken yet. <laughs> Sometimes history resists you. <laughs> uh, so uh, after struggling a little, this isn't a perfect solution. Instead of translated as food, I translate as nourishment. Um, okay, uh, l let me, uh, so, okay, uh, uh, w one other instance where um, a um, concordance was quite helpful. Uh, at the beginning of the flood story, there is a one-line poem. I know it's a poem because it scans. It has the same number of beats in each half of the line, and um, uh, it has, uh, so it has a strong rhythm, and, and there's a, a parallelism of meaning, or a complementarity of meaning. And it's, um, then the, in most translations, the windows of the heavens were open, and all the wellsprings of the great deep burst forth. But the word for windows, and it's been known for a, a long time that it means windows. It's a rare word. Um, Rashi, the great medieval French Hebrew commentator, says sometimes he, he offers a word in old French to parse the Hebrew. So he says, and in the, in the foreign language, this is fenestra, which is the old French version of fenetra. Okay, so uh, almost a thousand years ago, Rashi understood that, that it meant window. But why, the, the word in, the, in Hebrew is not chalon, which um, occurs dozens of times in the Hebrew Bible and is the modern Hebrew word for window, but it's arubot. So I turned to my trusty friend, the, uh, the Hebrew concordance, and um, I discovered that it appears maybe eight or nine times in the whole uh, biblical corpus. And in all but one of those times, it's poetic, it's in, in a line of poetry. So I needed a, to make that distinction, I needed a poetic diction English word. And I translated the line of poetry, it says, then the casements of the heavens were open and all the wellsprings of the great deep burst. Uh, the casements is, um, well, today we talk about a casement window, which, uh, but that, that, you have to always add window to it. Uh, but you, you find it in the poetry of Keats, you find it in, in Shakespeare. So it, it, it's poetry uh, and uh, it's a little um, uh, antiquated, which again suits my, my purpose. Okay, now I want to, um, Maybe, um, to, um, to show the, the detective work that, that goes with, with uh, well, this isn't detective work. Sometimes translators are cowardly. And I'm going to give you an example. When, uh, Hagar is, or Hager, depending on your preference, uh, I pronounce it the Hebrew way. When Hagar is banished to the wilderness with Ishmael, um, the water runs out in the water skin she's taken with her. And she and her son, were presum he's presumably fairly young, 
uh, are uh, under the blazing desert sun. And uh, she knows he can't survive very long. So she, and then there's the Hebrew verb, vatashlichenu, under one of the bushes. So what does this verb mean? If you look at the translations, you find she set him under one of the bushes, she placed him under one of the bushes, she, um, uh, the, the King James Version is a little better, but it doesn't go far. She thrust him under one of the bushes. This happens to be a, a Hebrew word that um, is, uh, has only one meaning. It always means to fling. It's the verb that's used when, when uh, in the first chapter of Genesis, we hear a pharaoh issuing the, the edict, every male who is born you will fling into the Nile. So it's a violent action. So what's going on? I think that uh, the, the Hebrew writer has a profound understanding of the emotions of the woman. This is her only son. He's going to die in a few minutes. She's absolutely desperate. So in a kind of paroxysm of grief, she flings him down, not too violently, but so she flings him down and runs off to a distance so she won't see when he dies. And this is where I think the translators have been cowardly. They don't have the imaginative boldness of the writer who really penetrates into the anguish, the utter despair of the, this mother. Okay, now I will give you just one more example, which is um, uh, where a certain amount of detective work w was uh, necessary. And that's fun. That, that is sometimes translating such a, 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 a remote, tech, remote from us text can be fun. Uh, you will recall, I'm sure that I'm speaking to a biblically literate audience, that um, when Samson marries the Philistine woman who's uh, unnamed in the, the narrative and poses th this riddle, uh, uh, the, the, with a bet, a wager, with the 30 Philistine guests. He says, if you can solve this riddle, I will give each of the 30 of you uh, a, a, a length of fine fabric and 30 changes of garment. And the, the, the word for changes is chalifot, with an F sound in the middle. F is in Fred, okay? Now, she wheedles out of him the solution to the riddle, and uh, he is outraged. Uh, and he says uh, in a line of poetry to them, had you not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle, meaning that they've been having sex with his wife. So he then storms down. I make, want to make sure. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, he then storms down to Ashkelon, uh, a um, Philistine city, kills 30 Philistines, and he takes from them not their chalifot with an F sound, but their chalitzot with a tz sound, like TZ, okay? So what does that mean? Well, everybody says the wager was for garments, so it's another word for garments. That sounds kind of like the, the first word for changes of garment. Well, there's only one other place 
in the Hebrew Bible where this word chalitzot appears. In uh, 1 Samuel, a bitter civil war is waged between the house of Saul and the house of David. And uh, Abner, Saul's um, savvy, battle-hardened commander, is being pursued on the battlefield by the fleet-footed Asael, who, because he's a fast runner, is going to overtake him. And Abner says, turn you to the right or to the left, and strike down one of the lads and take his chalitzot, his chalitza, I'm sorry, it's in the, the, the singular. Um, but by the way, Asael won't listen to him. So then, as I say, uh, Abner is an experienced warrior. What he does is he stops short, thrusts his spear uh, under his arm, into the soft belly of Asael and, and kills him. Uh, now, uh, I thought for a moment, and I said, well, wait a minute. Uh, what does a warrior take from his slain enemy on the battlefield? We know from Homer, we know from the, the, the story uh, of... Um, uh, uh, Patroclus and, and Hector taking Patroclus' armor. He takes his armor. And then it occurred to me that this same verbal stem uh, in uh, a, a different conjugation, chalutz, chalitza, chalutz, means the military va vanguard. So the chalitzot were the armor that the, um, uh, that the uh, elite fighters, the vanguard, were wearing. So what does this do to the, the, uh, the story? It throws a really interesting light on it because um, the wager was for garments, for changes of garments. What does he bring back? He brings back 30 sets of armor, which is far more valuable than garments. It also tells the, the wedding guests that the guys he killed were fighters, not, were warriors, not just uh, ordinary uh, Philistines, which is a kind of warning to them. He said, you see what I did to your countrymen in Ashkelon, you people better watch out. So a, a whole new light is thrown on, on at least a small piece of the, the Samson story. Okay, I think the, the, um, uh, the I, well, I could go on with examples, but instead, um, what I want to do is bring this presentation to a close and give you some time for your questions. Uh, so let me just summarize a, 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 as follows. No translation is perfect. Uh, as I say, you have to make compromises all the time. Comfortable um, compromises, sometimes uncomfortable compromises. Every once in a while, you, you'll come across a translation choice you made, and you'll say, did I do that? But I couldn't figure out a better way to do it. <laughs> so uh, we, we, we are all imperfect human beings in our moral lives, <laughs> in our, our political choices, and, and so forth, and, and that is certainly true of the, the work of translation. But I, I think th there are better approximations and uh, less good approximations of what's going on in, in 
a, a text that's written with such brilliance. And um, I have done my best to, to create a, a, an approximation which does more justice to the original, which gives readers in English a better sense of what's going on in the Hebrew. Thank you. Now, is there going to be a mic floating around in the... Oh, great. I'll take the first question. Um, first of all, um, Robert Alter, thank you. Um, as an English major in uh, 1982, I read The Art of Biblical Narrative, and I was delighted to know you're still alive and well, so that was... Uh, <laughs> yeah, and it was great hearing you tonight, even when the uh, casements of heaven have uh, poured <laughs> forth. Um, yes, from on high. We're not yes. yet up to, to Noah's world record of 40 yeah. days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, when I was uh, growing up in a, uh, in a Pentecostal church, the, the sermons that I remember most were the ones that used narrative and imagery, more so than um, some kind of didactic points, one, two, and three. And I'm just wondering, what, is, is there an... Is there a biblical image uh, or story that you find yourself keeping going, going back to that has kind of maybe uh, lingered deep in you, and what would that story or what would that, that oh, that's, image that's be? That's a good question. Well, I, I love the stories in Genesis. Maybe just a, a smidgen more, I, I love the whole David story. And... Uh, because it, it gives you, as also the Jacob story does, but even more fully, uh, an evolving human life from when he's uh, a, a young, uh, resourceful boy, uh, a beautiful young man whom everybody falls in love with, a military hero, and then in his prime, a, a calculating political agent, eventually at the mercy of his ruthless general, Joab. And then at the very end, uh, there's almost nothing else. I think there is nothing else like it in ancient literature. He's an old man shivering in his bed and evidently, if you see the way that uh, the prophet Nathan and Bathsheba manipulate him, a little bit adult. So th this is very moving. Uh, and th there's a pivotal point in the middle of that story, which I always go back, I always go back to. Um, everything that David says in the first half of the story could be subjected to um, political, could be seen as politically motivated. He's very calculating. But then um, when the, the infant that Bathsheba gives birth to dies after a week, uh, David has been fasting and uh, mourning and tearing his garments and, and so forth. Um, he suddenly gets up when he, he sees his courtiers whispering to each other. And he says, is the child dead? And they say, dead. And he goes off. And he bathes. He puts on royal raiment, and he orders a, a, a grand meal to be set before him. So his courtiers say, what is this? You know, when the child was still alive, you mourned and you lay on the ground, so on, and you, you fasted. And now that he's dead, you do this. And he says, and these are his first words that come from a kind of existential recognition rather than um, from political uh, motivation. He says, um, 
uh, when the child was still alive, uh, I fasted and prayed, perhaps God would have mercy. Now that he's dead, um, I am going to him. He will not come back to me. This stark recognition in the death of the child of his own mortality, that really hits you in the solar plexus, I think. Thanks for a great talk. Um, so I, you, you raised a number of issues about translation and even some doubts about whether certain words are words we can really understand, uh, if, if they only occur once, for instance. And I'm just... I'm sorry, I didn't hear all... If, if, excuse me. If, if certain words... Why? You mentioned some words, it's hard to even... We, we're not even really sure what exactly they mean, so we're speculating based on context and other near, nearby languages and so on. And I'm thinking if you're a theologian or a philosopher working in a biblical tradition and you're trying to come up with some kind of real precise account of you know, God's attributes, something like this, is this project hopeless in terms of like using biblical data? I mean, I'm just curious from your point of view if that seems like a totally misguided thing given some of the limitations of, of our grasp of this language and, and oh, its yeah. translatability. Or it, or what cautions would you offer this kind of thing? That, that's an important question. Now, I, I don't want to exaggerate. That, that, that is, the, the, there are, um, let's say, dozens, maybe even many dozens of, of words that appear only once. I'm sure somebody has tabulated that somewhere. Uh, but there aren't many hundreds or thousands of such words. So, so let's say the bulk of the verbiage in the Hebrew Bible are words that we, uh, we more or less uh, understand. Uh, the, um, what what I, I think we can do is by being very attempt attentive and using uh, the uh, philological tools, we can get closer to a lot of biblical statements and even statements that have to do with aspects of faith. Here's one of my favorite examples. And I always forget the exact Psalm, maybe it's Psalm 63, it's somewhere in the 60s, uh, the speaker says at the beginning of the psalm, okay, the conventional translation, my soul thirsted or thirst for you, God, as in a parched land without water. Okay, that's beautiful. Okay, here's the catch. The, uh, and I've gone on uh, at length about this in print. Um, the word that since the, the Septuagint and the Vulgate has always been translated as soul, and which indeed means soul in post-biblical Hebrew, in rabbinic Hebrew, nefesh, actually doesn't mean soul. That is... It means, it, it, you can hear from the sound of it, nefesh, it's a breathing word. And it, it means life breath. Now that life breath that, that God in uh, Genesis 2 instills in the, the first man. Um, the, I don't think that the biblical... Um, uh, writers had a notion of a soul as distinct from the body, you know, that sharp dichotomy. Um, so, but soul means a lot of different things. Its meaning kind of keeps sliding. In, in the, it means life breath. It means um, throat or neck because the throat is the passageway for the, the, uh, 
life breath. For those of you who were English majors, that's what we call metonymy, uh, where two things are connected because they're touching each other. And it also means appetite, uh, and I, I can enumerate. Uh, so it's the translated despair. You can't translate it the same way always. OK, let's go back to that verse in Psalm and what its implications are theologically. The, if you look at the context, a parched land without water, and the parallel second half of the line, which mentions flesh, it's hard to escape the conclusion that what it means is throat. My throat thirsted for you, O oh God, thirst for you, O oh God, in a parched land without water. Now, that is not as beautiful as my soul thirst for you, but it has a certain dynamism, a certain punch, because the notion of spirituality in the book of Psalms is anchored in the human body. And that's, I think, something that's worth theological pondering. So uh, what the, the psalmist is thinking is this. Imagine you're wandering through the desert of the Negev in the land of Israel. And a lot like Hagar, your water runs out. You're desperate for a drop of water. Your, your throat is parched. Uh, you can hardly breathe. That's how desperate I am to uh, have some kind of communication with you, God. So that's very strong in its way. And it's, it's different from our preconceptions of what's being said in the Bible. Um, in your uh, study of Hebrew, any comment um, of the relationship with Aramaic? Yeah, uh, not a lot, but I, I, I'll, I'll say something historical. Um, the uh, Aramaic is to Hebrew roughly, say, what French is to Italian. There are a lot of cognate words, and then there are words that are not cognate. So, for example, the Hebrew word for bread is lechem. The Aramaic word for bread is lachma. And th there are two books where there, there are a sequence of chapters in Aramaic. That's Nehemiah and... Um, Daniel. Um, and then uh, the, w when Jacob and, and his father-in-law, Lot, agree on a kind of mutual non-aggression uh, pact, they, they put up a marker of stones to indicate the border between their territories. And Jacob calls it gal Ed, which means pile of of witness, and um, uh, Lot calls it Yegar Sahaduta, which means the same thing in Aramaic. Um, so Ar Aramaic was around quite early. Uh, I don't think you can anyway say that, that Hebrew derives from Aramaic, uh, but there are certain interesting things that happen in, in the, the late biblical period. For example, the Job poet, who has the biggest vocabulary of any poet in the Hebrew Bible, um, sometimes takes Aramaic words, because Har Aramaic w w was uh, spoken already to some extent by uh, the, the, um, the Jews of his time. Uh, he takes some Arama Aramaic words and 
treats them grammatically and morphologically as Hebrew words and expands the Hebrew language in that way. Professor Alter, I've, I've so uh, enjoyed this presentation and, and wish um, I'm planning to read the Hebrew uh, uh, Bible translation, the three volumes in 2024, and so, uh, but also wish you, you had uh, done the audio reading of, of it. Uh, looks like someone else has. But. Uh, your voice dropped at the Yeah, I wish, I wish you had done the audio reading of your uh, translation. Yeah. Um, so I've got a question about, um, you, you spoke about the two loves, and it's clear, so clear how immersed you are in the text. And I want, my question, I guess, is about reception and um, to the other love of the, of the sort of the reception language. And so um, in English, there's also the communities who are right, speaking English and, and, and hearing English. And, and I, I, like Dana Joya has sort of said, there's, there's two kinds of uh, literature, especially poetry, some that, that goes on the the page and, and others that go on in the air, right? The, the poetry that's read. I'm wondering about how, as you were translating, you thought about the different communities that were gonna be reading and listening to your translation. Specifically the church, of course, uh, the mosque, Right, so, right. As, as well as uh, the synagogue, and, and you know, of course, I mean, obviously, we wouldn't even have the Hebrew scriptures if it wasn't for the church and and the, the sort of maintaining the uh, sort of the text over the centuries. But but what have you, or how have you thought? And and you're as you're making these complex decisions uh -huh. okay. about how the text goes. How how do these competing interests or conflicting or or, or, or resonant interests? from religious communities work in your translation process? Okay, that's a, a, an important question, I think. Uh, recently, the, um, the British scholar, who's also a, a priest in the Church of England, uh, John Barton, uh, wrote a book about translating the Bible. What's the title? Uh, it really came out only a couple of months ago. And he correctly uh, emphasizes that, that, that there cannot be one, quote, correct translation of the Bible, because it depends on the community. For example, if you're translating the Bible for Christian liturgical use, you might not at all want to do the sort of things that, that, that I do. If you're translating the Bible for uh, American believers uh, who do not have very sophisticated social level, you might actually want to do what uh, a translator of the Bible, Eugene Peterson, who uh, I was first horrified <laughs> when, when I looked at it, is because he does things like um, uh, give us this day our, our daily bread becomes, um, give us three square meals. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, Cain's words to God when he's challenged by God about the, the killing of a Abu, uh, I actually love this one. Uh, he, he says, um, am I my brother's babysitter? <laughs> so uh, I can see a certain, as I said, I, I was first horrified, but when I thought about it and kind of followed John Barton's argument, um, I came to and said, well, maybe the, there are uh, certain communities that need that, as, as different as that is from what, what uh, the, the, um, the Hebrew and the Greek sound to me, uh, there are certain communities that, that the Bible may become more meaningful, more immediately accessible to them in that kind of 
highly colloquial, very American translation. Oh, what I can add is um, I did not have a specific community in mind. I wanted to do it this way. That, that is, uh, since I thought, as I tried to illustrate uh, today, th that the subtle literary shaping uh, of uh, the, the Hebrew, its rhythms, its uh, precision and nuance and word choice that was very important. I wanted to do that. It turns out that a broader range of communities than I would have imagined have responded to that. Uh, I'll give you, uh, the, the emails have slowed down now, but I, I got a, a whole spate of them for quite a while. And here's one of my favorites a man who began with a, a little autobiographical note that he was a, um, a, a pastor in the Church of Scotland and that he had spent five years studying biblical Hebrew in his preparation for his uh, clerical role. Uh, and he said the following. <laughs> he said, e every time... Uh, and he's now retired. Uh, he said, every time a, a new translation came out in English, he and his wife would rush out to buy it. And then they would be bitterly disappointed. And he said, his wife said to him, she must be a very smart woman, she said, the trouble with these translations is that they're bossy. In other words, they're telling you what they think you should think that it means rather than what it says. And he said, and then um, we got your uh, translation of the Hebrew Bible, and he said, at last there's a translation that, that sounds authentically like the, the Hebrew. So um, I don't think my translation is for every community, but I'm surprised, especially most of the um, fan mail I've got have been from people of faith, different kinds of, uh, of faith. I mean, Catholic, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Baptist, and um, uh, modern Orthodox Jewish. And they all seem to be responding uh, enthusiastically. So I think I'm on the right track anyway. Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm, I'm wondering. A little bit blinded by the yeah, light. That's why I'm coming forward. I can move forward too. Uh, I'm wondering uh, what value, if any, uh, you think the Greek Septuagint has for uh, translating uh, the Hebrew Bible. Okay, uh, an apt and succinct que uh, um, uh, question. Well, the Septuagint is very literal. Uh, the, it couldn't in any way be a, a guide to the stylistic um, uh, uh, translation of the Bible, but it does sometimes help in another way. Whatever Hebrew text the third century BCE translators of the, the Bible had in front of them. It was not in all respects identical with the Hebrew text that has been passed down to us. Now, in some cases, you can see that, that uh, the, the Hebrew they had was sort of dubious, where, where the, there'd be a whole additional paragraph, uh, and uh, it looks like somebody is fleshing out something uh, in the, the Hebrew. But he, sometimes you see that they were working with a text that was more reliable. A simple, neat example is Cain and Abel. That is, 
the, um, the story of the first murder starts as follows. And Cain said to Abel, and then the very next words, he's killing him. Now, there is no other instance in the entire Hebrew Bible where you have the formula for introducing direct speech, and X said to Y, and then no speech at all. Uh, and it, th there's something missing there. The way they translate it, and I'm cautiously assuming they had a Hebrew text that said this, and Cain said to Abel, let us go out to the field, because then he can get him alone and he can murder him. So I adopted that with, with explaining why I did that in a footnote. So from time to time with textual di difficulties, um, the Septuagint can be helpful, but you have to use it carefully because all translators are scoundrels, <laughs> present company included, and a, a translation might sort of make things clear and simple when they're not clear and simple in, in the original. So you just have to use um, a certain amount of common sense. I have a question, if I may. Sure. Um, thank you for your work. It's sensational. Um, but uh, for me, uh, what you're translating is the word of God. And so I'm just curious how that may weigh upon you, that here you are, in fact, looking at the words of God on paper and then preparing them okay. to be prepared for someone like me, which I thank right. you for. Okay. Um, first, I don't think it's it, the... Um, Belief of the, of the Bible is the word of God is certainly entirely legitimate and understandable. I think what is not legitimate is thinking that it's all dictation by God. Uh, th that is, uh, all the evidence is that th these are human beings who were listening to God, felt God was speaking to them, and then translated it, I don't want to use the word, transposed it into human language. And even as uh, I've, um, I've indicated, used the artful connections conventions, I'm sorry, of uh, human um, uh, literary speech to convey God's words. Um, for example, oh, let's take prophecy, because that, that's the, the most clear-cut instance in, in which the, the prophet often begins by, by, by saying, um, uh, the word of the Lord to me, and then quote. Now, the quotation, I don't think is transcribing exact words that, that God was dictating. I, I think... Um, if we take Isaiah, since I touched on him before, uh, Isaiah has a, a sense which he fully believes is God's understanding that he wants to convey to the people that something is rotten in the kingdom of Judah. And... Uh, he does this mostly in poetry, 
why poetry? For two reasons. A practical one, that all poetry is a memory machine. Things are literally um, memorable in the sense whether it's rhyme or parallelism or, um, uh, or metric uh, um, uh, uh, set uh, meters that it impresses the words on the listeners so they remember them. Um, uh, the ox knows his master, the donkey its owner's uh, manger. So you have the parallelism, and as soon as you get the, the um, ox knows his master, uh, you, you, you can easily remember the second part, okay? Um, so here is a, a prophet, I, I am quite sure, fully in the full conviction that God is speaking to him, using the human convention of, of poetry to um, convey God's message. And, and doing things like that wordplay that I, I illustrated from, from uh, Isaiah. Um, so I, I hope that gives you some sense of where I stand. I have one last question, which I thought of before. Um, you may not be familiar with the scholar Laman Sana. Uh, Laman Sana, he taught at, at Yale in, uh, well, he taught um, Islam, and he also taught um, comparative religion. Um, he himself was from the Gambia, brought up as a Muslim, and converted as a teenager to Christianity, which was a little risky. I'll just leave it at that. Yes. Um, but he went on to write many books about um, uh, Christianity, global religion, etc. And he had the idea or the insight that um, the 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 Bible is translatable and always has been being translated. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Islam, you really aren't reading right. the Quran if you aren't reading the Arabic. And, and I wanted to know how true his insight is for the Jewish tradition as it is for the Christian. Because, you know, when the, Jerome is translating the Bible right. into Latin, the Armenians very early are translating sure. it into Armenian, yada, 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 yada. Down, down the road, and, and Eugene Peterson is translating the Bible into colloquial vernacular American right. shtick. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> so, oh, so, but, it, but, it, but that isn't frowned upon. Um, I mean, you may be in horror at some of it, but you know what I'm saying. So, what it, the difference um, between? And I don't. You know, in the Buddhist and Hindu traditions, the Vedas and the sutras, no, don't you don't have to, well, but you don't, I don't know that translation is a problem at any rate, but between Islam and Christianity and Judaism, where is the place of translation? Okay, a really good question. Um, the first translation of the Hebrew Bible, of course, was the Greek which was done in Alexandria. And um, it, it was done because the Jewish diaspora in Egypt pretty much didn't know Hebrew anymore. So if they were going to, to have any access to, um, Christian, to, um, to the Bible, it would have to be through translation. I would say that, that there was not Jewish disapproval, but mixed feelings about it. That, that is, the, the, there's a statement somewhere in the Talmud that, that in the day that the Bible was turned into Greek, the walls of the temple wept. <laughs> um, but, um, through the ages, um, well, I'll, let me put it th th this way. Um, 
I, I think that th there was never this categorical resistance to translation that you have with, with the Quran. And over the centuries, you have various Jewish translations into vernaculars. Uh, sometime around the, the I think that the 10th, 11th century, um, the leading Jewish scholar of his time, who was also uh, a philosopher, Sadia Gaon, who uh, lived in what's now Iraq, translated the Bible into Arabic because the, the, that Jewish community mostly did not know uh, Hebrew anymore. Uh, in more recent times, there were translations of the Bible into Yiddish. But I, I think that there, there was always a, a, a surviving remnant uh, of uh, Jews who felt, well, we've always known Hebrew. We're not going to let go of the Hebrew. We will study it, and we will read the Bible in the language that it was written. But it's not more canonical yeah. now. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. I've been so looking forward to this, and we had many ups and downs on the way to this yeah. evening. <laughs> so thank you, Professor Alter. I want to thank you. Thank you all for coming and let you know what's upcoming. Um, the first, if you're, if you're looking for something to do next Saturday, um, the former Archbishop of Canterbury is giving the first Chadwick Oden lectures at St. Michael's Abbey. I think it begins at 10, the first one is at 10 in the morning. There's a break, there's a lunch, and then there's the second lecture. So I invite you to come and sign up. It's actually filling up. So um, there are some spaces, I'm told, if you uh, want to come to that and see some very old books as well, because Tom Oden had 63 in Canabula. If you can, I mean, that's wow. kind of, yeah, for one human being, what was he doing? Anyway, um, you know, it was legitimate. Anyway, so I invite you all to come to that, uh, if you can. And our next um, salon will be in February, not February, sorry. I've lost my mind along with everything else. Um, we'll be in March, it's March 25th, which used to be New Year's Day and used to be when you inaugurated presidents and when the year began, but that changed. At any rate, on, we will be having the opening of Maya Lisa Engelhardt's show of the Days of Creation, um, it, curated by John Silvis with help from Ettore Roca, who is a scholar of the work of Peter Brandis and Maya Lisa Engelhardt. Um, there will be a lecture by Matthew Milliner, I think focusing on his his uh, most recent book, The Mother of the Lamb, and, and also it's the importance of the image of the Mother of the Lamb in art. And he may say a few things about Maya's paintings too. And then the scholar Jeremy Begbie, scholar and also pianist of some considerable um, quality, will be giving the performance lecture uh, at that event. And Jeremy Begbie taught for many years at Cambridge um, and is the creator of, of several programs uh, of, of, com of the importance of the arts, particularly music and theology, and has been for some years at Duke where he is a professor of theology and the arts, and has done a whole lot of projects. He's also a very good speaker, and he can play the piano. So come to that if you can. And then in May, we will have a salon. The date isn't finalized on a totally different topic. It will be, it will be Michael Schellenberger, who wrote the book San Francisco, How, Why Progressives Cannot Run Cities. And, uh, 
What makes him particularly interesting is he is not a man of the right. He is a man of the middle left. And he, he's got quite an interesting background. And uh, he's, 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 from my perspective, he's young. At any rate, it should be an interesting um, salon. And, uh, and also, there's a gift for you tonight. Um, on the back table, there are copies of Robert Alter's book, The Art of Bible Translation, for you to take home if you want to. It's a gift from us to you, and frankly, it's a gift from him to the world. So, thank you again, Professor Alter. We'll see you all in March. <laughs>